What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Collider Interview Studio at Sundance 2024. I am lucky to be sitting with the team behind the documentary, Sue Bird in the Clutch. Congratulations on the film. I was so happy that I wound up getting assigned to this interview. <laughs> Big fan of yours for a very long time. Thank you. So first, before we begin our conversation, we have to give a special shout out to Filmio, our wonderful sponsor who lets us be here in Park City celebrating independent film. Filmio is breaking barriers by putting the power to greenlight films in the hands of creators and fans. If you want to learn more about Filmio and their community, check out their website, film.io. All right, Sarah, you're first up on my list here. Yes. Sometimes the internet isn't accurate, so I'll ask you this first, actually. This is your feature directorial debut, right? That's right. <laughs> okay. Why make that move with a documentary, and what was it about Sue's story that you thought would best suit your skill set and how you wanted to, you know, show your world, show the world your craft as a feature filmmaker? Ooh, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's a documentary because that's the space that I've been making films in for the last decade. Um, I was lucky enough to be. Um, uh, brought this film by the producers, by, by Jay. And, um, you know, when I started researching Sue and her career and everything that she has done um, as an athlete, but also her impact on the game and her contribution to women's sports, um, I just fell in love with it. I was really inspired by the story. Um, you know, we got uh, quite a lot of rejection at the beginning of trying to get this movie made. And I think that just set a fire off in me where I was just, the more no's I heard, the more yes my brain said, this is the right story to make. I was reading that in the press notes. That is absolutely wild to me that you face so much rejection right out the gate. It, I mean, feels like a no brainer. It, I mean, it did to me. Um, and, you know, we felt we had a really strong story and um, a lot to bring to the table. And getting financing for any film is never a no brainer. But given the, the interest in sports and male sports docs that are out there in the space, we knew that there was an audience for it. So we felt like we were bringing a very, very high quality product to the table. And to just kind of be met with that you know, resistance, you know, just just felt like it was shocking, but it also, I think, just, you know, reignited, you know, all of our passion to tell this story. Well, standing your ground on this and making it happen will probably make less people experience that rejection in the future. So thank you for doing that. I hope so. Jay, a question for you, because I know you're producing a lot now, but I believe this is your first time producing a documentary. So... Two questions about that. First one, were you interested in making a documentary or was it specific to Sue's story? Did her story uh, inspire you to get into this realm? No, I mean, it's a little bit of both, but really this was Sue's story. I think, um, you know, my producing partner, um, Aaron Bergman, you know, we... Uh, I have a production company, Black Bar Mitzvah, and we always talk about we love taking worlds. People think they know, tilting them on their axis and showing you that world from a different point of view. And for us, Sue's story was like, exactly that we think we know women's basketball but we don't really a because there's not enough storytelling there's not enough op there's not enough opportunities out there for women who play in the league to get out and and control their own narratives and tell their own stories um and then there's this other piece of like the knowledge that we really have of the WNBA kind of comes through this NBA lens i mean they a lot of the marketing that we've seen in the past, for example, and even some of the deals and stuff are often formatted um, from the NBA to WNBA in the past. Again, Sue can speak to, to a lot of those changes, but we were like, oh, that's really how we know it. So what if we take someone like Sue, who has had this legendary rock star, badass, amazing career and like give her the mic, right? And let her tell her own story, be a part of telling her own story. And in doing that, she's also telling the story of, of the WNBA and of women's basketball and of women's sports at large to some degree. Um, so it really was Sue's story that really, really just like sparked an interest for us and made us want to jump in and actually made us want to beg her. <laughs> to let us tell her story. Oh yes, I'm gonna get to that in a minute. One more question for you, Jay. What surprised you most about what it takes to produce a documentary feature versus a, a traditionally scripted narrative? Um, I, I don't think anything surprised me. I've just been, I've been a part of some doc stuff before and have done 
some doc series. So nothing, I don't think anything surprised me. I think it's back to what Sarah spoke to though, was, um, the amount of rejection that we got on this when we took it out. Um, and I will never forget us being on the phone. We were on a zoom actually with Sue and she's like, listen, if you guys don't sell it, like I get it. Like it's hard. Like we, you know, this is what we scream from the mountains. Like we have the product, we are here, we are entertaining. People are showing up and still we don't get the opportunities. And I just remember this fire that was lit for all of us, for our entire team, this fire was lit of like, first of all, we're not letting Sue down. Second of all, we're going to tell this story. And even if we got the nose that we got across town, you know who you are. Um, even if we got those nose, we were going to make those people come back. We were going to go find the money for this doc, make this doc and make all those people come back on the back end. Like that's how we all felt about it. I love the thought of the nose going and seeing the movie and being like, shit, well, they'll all be mess there that up. They'll be there mess tomorrow. that up. Yeah. I like that attitude. Um, Emily, for you now, I know you have a pretty significant amount of documentary producing experience. How are you able to apply that experience to this film? And maybe what expertise could you offer in terms of how best to shape Sue's story into a narrative format, a documentary format? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for us, we really early on wanted to map out, there's so much you could tell about Sue's story, right? And so many themes that you can expand upon just looking at her story. We knew from the start, we had early on in meetings, we were you know, there's so many ways to tell it, but it made a lot of sense that we were tracking Sue's final year and to use that as our spine, um, as kind of a TikTok to get us through the story. And then as we could, as we moved through that, we could get into the other themes of her story of um, coming into the WNBA very early on in a completely different league. And as she grew, she helped the league grow. And we really wanted to follow that trajectory through her story. Um, I think what is so tempting when you're following somebody who's so dynamic, who's so exciting to watch and in such an exciting world, there are day to day, it's like, well, God, she's doing this amazing thing. Like, should we film that? And we just really had to continue to come back to the story. What is the story we're telling? And what is it that we really need in order to tell it? And she obviously, you know, the physicality of being an athlete, is only one aspect. A lot of it is the focus. And we really were cognizant of only taking the time that we needed um, to tell that story and not get in the way of, of her focus in what she was there to do. So now that we've talked around you for five minutes, <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about what you thought about like the team of people at this table and also the people who were involved that aren't here today that gave you the confidence that these are the people I should trust with my story. Yeah, a big part of it was um, a good friend of mine, Ryan Ruco, who is an ESPN announcer, essentially the voice of the WNBA, is really good friends with Aaron. Jay's partner, also friends with Jay. So immediately there was a trust, right? Because I trust Ryan. And Ryan was kind of the, the connecting point there. And um, from, from that point on, there was a pitch where it was just me, Jay, Aaron, my agent at the time, um, just listening. You know, I was just listening, but I trusted. I trusted already. So um, I think as a female athlete in this world, you can get a little jaded at times. You know, you, you you do hear a lot of no's and it can be really tiresome and it can feel rejecting and dejecting and you have to find the energy to get back up all the time. But here was a scenario where I really trusted it. I didn't feel like that was going to be, be the case. Um, and obviously they proved me right. So it allowed um, for me to show up as myself and for, I think, all of us to, to get a really great doc done. So you trusted them, but was there any specific thing that maybe made you think like, we can do this together, but I need to make sure that, you know, this layer of my experience is in the spotlight in a significant manner? You know, I, I actually never thought of it that way. Um, but this pitch meeting that I'm referring to did happen at the end of the 2020 WNBA season. Um, for my team, we had just won, which was amazing. So I was on a little bit of a high. But at the same time, the league was really stepping into its own identity. Um, you know, for anyone that watches a doc, you see there's there is like a trajectory of how this league has grown. I was on the same. I was like parallel pathing that in a lot of ways, which is pretty cool to see now. I never really thought of it that way until doing this project. Um, but that pitch meeting happened at a time where women's sports was really on the come up 
I mean, it was really starting to, you know, people were taking note, viewership numbers were changing, and it, it really just felt like the right time to tell my story more than anything. So all the pieces fell together. So given what you just said, and, and the idea of you running into folks telling you no, it, it makes me think of the, the Filmio question we've been uh, asking, because it's a company that's all about putting the power in the creator's hands. For any of you, whether it's a, a film, a show you worked on, or something in basketball, can you recall a time? Time when someone put the creative power in your hands when you didn't think you were going to get it? I mean, I feel like Sarah and Emily should say on this doc. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. No, 100%. I, I, I would actually agree with that because, you know, I, I, I felt like there were so many pivotal moments in, in, a, in the way that this film got made. And we started in 2021. And really, we were just going shoot to shoot at that stage because we just didn't know whether we could find the money, like what, what was going to be the trajectory of this, you know, what, what Sue was thinking and feeling in terms of her retirement at that time. So we were really just trying to cobble it together um, and we were still exploring creatively will this be a series will this be a film like what will, will be the the strongest and, and most powerful tool to tell Sue's story so you know I, I feel like the, the the producers and Sue just kept giving me that trust and we're like if you're gonna put the energy in you know everyone else will be be behind you and and vice versa so i just felt like everyone else was doubling down i was doubling down this felt like kismet to me i thought if we we all are i don't know maybe we're dizzy and crazy by doing this but there's something in that craziness that propels you to just make the impossible um and when i would see Sue play and and all the women um, in the W, I just always felt so inspired by what they just they just got on with it, you know they just came out they just did this thing, um, and, and I just thought it, it's this is inspirational to me if if they can do it you know damn it I can do it so I don't know it was a bit of the producers giving me that but Sue and the the players also you know inspiring me beautiful answer. I just want to say real quick, sorry, Sue. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go. You sure? Yeah. I'll go after this, we're here for you. No, 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 go. I'll go after I, I want to say a big piece of that is Waffle Iron. Um, yes. So we should. I just want to shout out Justin Biskin and his team at Waffle Iron because they are a big, big piece of that. They they did finance this film, and when we had our first meeting with them. Uh, by the time we got off, before we even got off the meeting, Justin's main thing that he came back to us was like, we want to empower this creative team to tell this story in the way that the story, excuse me, story needs to be told. And we are here to help you in any way we can do that. And you don't often get that from financiers. So I just want to give a shout out to them because they were um, very, very helpful and, and supporting in this process. Yeah, no, the, only, the only thing I was going to add, it's um, it's actually been one of my favorite parts about this process sitting here now is um, I think some of what everyone on the quote unquote team has experienced in terms of the nose and, you know, is are we going to get it done? I'm like, that is the life. That is my life in women's basketball. Right. Being told no. So it's this really, I think, cool connecting point between us all now where. You're told no, you have to find a way. You're told no, you have to find another way. And you're like, I swear this is good. I swear people are gonna be interested. I swear this, I swear that. And then now you're sitting here at Sundance and it's that moment where I've experienced it, I've been lucky enough to experience it as an athlete where you know maybe I'm in front of people showing them viewership numbers of WNBA playoffs game, playoff games saying, see, I told you. And now we're sitting up here at Sundance being like, See, I told you. And it's kind of uh, interesting. You guys got to experience what it is to be a female athlete. <laughs> How'd you like it? No, I'm joking. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, of pivots and kind of, you know, evolving the film on the fly, I was wondering, because originally the movie was supposed to cover your, your final season, and then it wasn't your final season. Did you all have the heads up that that was going to happen, or was that truly an on-the-spot decision that you had no idea about? Can I just tell you the text messages that went back and <laughs> forth about, should somebody reach out to Sue? Should somebody ask Sue? Is Sue gonna what do you think sue's gonna do does anybody know what sue's gonna do we all there was a there was an email chain about it there was a text chain about it we didn't no one knew when the appropriate time to ask was 
we wanted to make sure that Sue had enough space and respect where she was like at her t- in, in that process. Um, but I just remember like all these emails and text messages going back. We're like, it's been two weeks. Should we ask her now? And everybody's like, no, you just have to let her. And we did use Ryan once again, Ryan Rucco, shout out to Ryan, who is one of the producers on this as well. We used Ryan as the kind of the conduit to get, to get closer to the answer um, that we ultimately got, which was she wasn't retired. And, I just want to add a small bit to that, that it was after the Olympics and uh, Sue had, had, you know, won her fifth gold medal. And uh, I I was, you know, we have cans on and, and, uh, you know, Sue was mic'd and she was talking, but there were, there were words that she was using that were future tense. And I was like, (laughs) wait a minute, (laughs) that means... Does that mean what I think it means? And so I was like messaging the the executive producers, like, do we know? Does anyone know? Because you know, I, I'm I'm just hearing this on the cans, and I feel like maybe there's you know there, there's there's a thought happening here that's germinating, and I don't know. You you were going through it, so. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, I wish I could remember. I'm like, what did I say? Of, can you tell the story of like, sorry, this is just one of my favorite things. You tell the story of how you talk to a couple of people about their own retirements mm-hmm. and like what you, yeah. wh- how you should or yeah. shouldn't do. And I don't think that made the doc, but I'm just so, oh, yeah. I love that story. Yeah. yeah. Um, I became friendly. Well, Ray Allen, a UConn grad, I've known him forever. And then I became friendly the last couple of years with um, CC Sabathia. And if, if you know their, their stories as athletes and their retirements, totally different talk to Ray. Ray just like kind of faded into the back. His was a little bit different because there was like a question mark around him signing with the team, even though he hadn't played in a year. So it's a little bit different, but he was very much, and I talked to him and he was very much like, no, like you finish your career and you just kind of go into the sunset. You announce when you're done. You don't need all the like hoopla for lack of a better. I was like, yeah. Cause I kind of was on that side of the fence for a while. Then I talked to Cece and Cece was like, cause he had just gone through a retirement season where he announced and he's like, you have to do it. You, you have to do it. And the number one reason is you have to do it for the fans. You have to share this moment. You have to let, have to let them say goodbye to you. And I never thought of it in that way. And that really tipped the scale for me, not necessarily to come back, but it may, it, it did like play a role. I think I still had some basketball left. So that was really ultimately the, the deciding factor, but it definitely was the reason I decided to announce the retirement while, um, my final season, what ended up being my final season was still going on. Such a beautiful way to think about it. I've definitely had that with athletes retiring, but because I'm film and TV heavy, it makes me think of when a TV show gets cut off too soon. Yeah. And then the viewer doesn't have that sense of closure. And, yeah, and that's it, a good point. it hurts. It hurts. I know. <laughs> so, that was something that didn't make it into the final cut of the documentary. Can you give me kind of the opposite? Something that you weren't prepared for what big of a role it was going to play in the finished cut, like something emerged that something that emerged as like a pivotal point of the story that you weren't expecting at the start. Uh, I mean, first thing that comes to mind is our initial rough cut, UConn, (laughs) <laughs> Sue's college career was like a feature length film in its own right and we were like <laughs> okay how much of this story do we really need to tell but there is a really um, pivotal moment there um, wh- where Sue has an injury and um, she's able to reflect on herself and and where she's meant to head in this game and for us we really wanted to take the time to tell that story and I don't think any of us we're anticipating it, but UConn was gracious. They gave us boxes of VHS tapes, of DVDs, of photos. And we have this team who were just taking their time, you know, scanning every photo. And we just had such wonderful material, home videos that, that Sue and Diana Taurasi had taken. And it just, it just spoke to us so much that it became a larger part than I think we were anticipating. That's such an important part to include because I have to imagine there's many there's many young athletes out there who could think it's all over when something like that happens. And to be able to see you power through that and where you wound up, it's probably very inspiring to a lot of people. There's one thing that I would add that was a real discovery for me, and that was um, – really including Sue's engagement with fans and the way that Sue makes them feel. 
because once I was filming, I couldn't help but become a fan. And I know that that's like a documentary no-no. Um, there were there were so many times I wanted to like high five that performance and way to go. And you just can't help it because it's the atmosphere is electric. And when I would see that that exchange and that just joy and happiness, I thought I have to get that joy into the film. I really want to show what that's like because it's it's positive and it's just. Yeah, it was a very palpable thing when I was there, and I, I, I really hope that came through in the film. Oh, I have a follow-up for you, Sue, on that point. I, I pulled this quote from the notes because I, I felt like it was important to emphasize here. Sarah, you said, the hardest thing for me was getting Sue to acknowledge what she's achieved, her legacy and what she's created for girls and for women coming into the game behind her. Now that the documentary exists, and I, I'm assuming you've seen it, it is that undeniable? Do you have to recognize and celebrate that you did that? I never denied it. I just didn't want to say it. <laughs> you should say it. You should be proud of it. Maybe. Watch the doc. You'll see. Okay. I, I give enough, in a little bit. Enough. I give in a little bit. So who's the greatest WNBA point guard of all time? <laughs> I think it's me. <laughs> <laughs> we I'll love making Sue talk about herself. Whisper. We love it. I, as you should. As you, as you should. Seriously. I'll end on a film-specific question for you, Sue, because we are talking about how many people out there you inspire in the sports realm. But I'm curious, because we're at the Sundance Film Festival, is there a film you've seen in the past that inspired you to do something? Ooh, great question. A film I've seen in the past that inspired me. Um, let me think, let me think. I'm like, a lot of the sports docs, uh, um, well, this is really putting me on the spot. Okay, I have one, oh, finally. <laughs> My dad took me to see Hoop Dreams when it came out in like the local theater. Obviously it was like a smaller film, so we had to go to like some random theater that was like 20, 30 minutes away. Um, and it, it's not necessarily that I could see myself in those stories, it was just that these stories were being told and my dad, you know, took that moment to say like, hey, there's this, you know, this documentary about these two high school kids in Chicago, like, let's go check it out. And it was just really, it was just a really memorable experience. Like I, I can like vividly remember it and feel what it felt like to see that on the big screen. Again, it wasn't that I like pulled something from it. I just remember how it made me feel. I'm always here for a Hoop Dreams reference, okay. always. <laughs> I must let you go. I will say huge congratulations on the film and thanks for sharing some of your experience with us. To okay. everybody out there, Sue Bird in the clutch. Keep an eye out for it. Also, big thanks to Filmio and stay tuned for more from Sundance 2024 soon.